Jake and Jim, man, thank you for joining the show. We're pumped to have you, dude. Thanks for having us. It's good to see you again. Too bad it's uh, it's not on the on the track with our cleats. I know, I know. Well, yeah. Well, you guys made a comment in the email about uh, the pre four hundred jitters. I honestly about threw up. I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah. That's honestly the one thing that every year I'm like, do I really want to do this? Like, do I really want to get out there and run a 400? <laughs> yeah, I was worried in April because one, I hadn't done any fundraising. And two, I was yeah. like, I'm not in shape. Like if this thing doesn't get canceled, I'm going to pull every muscle in my body. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Pe- people would be getting exposed for sure. Yeah. yeah. For me, it's the the uh, 500 meter row. Like that's the event oh. that I dread the most. Dude, absolutely. I've, I've, I mean, I'll, I'm not ashamed to admit, I've, I've puked the last two years. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I've, like, I, I spend all that time after that event, pre, like, going into the next one, just like trying to keep it down unsuccessfully. Yeah. <laughs> you leave it out there for sure. For sure. For sure. Well, actually, th- this might be a, a good place to start. Um, for those who don't know, like, we, we do the D10, we've done it the last couple of years together, which has been an absolute blast. Uh, but you both, absolutely crush it now i'm over here complaining about the 400 but you guys are running like some insane times like you'd be winning like state track meets <laughs> some of the times that you guys are putting up I, i'm really curious uh how on earth are you guys managing to stay like that competitive at a high level with sprinting running endurance like especially considering that you guys are like running a rapidly growing business yeah, man. I mean, it, it's the same lifestyle that, that you live too. So you can't be too modest over there. You know, you're, uh, it, it's, it's a, it, those two things go hand in hand for us, fitness and, and sort of focus at work. Like, I think we can't operate at, in our careers at a high level, unless yeah. we're sort of still, still getting after it in the gym, on the field, pushing each other, you know, and, and you feel better, you know, if uh, mornings where I don't work out, I'm like, damn it, I should have worked out this morning because I don't feel as great as I could. Yeah, I would say that, I mean, the 400 and the 800 are, are, are probably the two that, that we, of like the, the top group, those are the only ones that we win. You know, you guys are kicking our butts in, in the bench press and all the other ones. So I think that um, it's probably like our sweet spot, you know, um, we're, we're probably the lighter guys. But also, to Jim's point, you just shift like your focus um, and like you just get out on that track. You know, like you're going to get after something on, on most days anyway. You yeah. just force yourself to get out on that track. and. I think the biggest thing too is like people we were talking about that pre 400 jitters, you know, that pre doing something really hard jitters, the, the two of us face that and run 400s as hard as we can before the day of the race. And I yeah. think a lot cause, and it sucks, you know, no matter what that feeling after you run a 400 is going to suck. Right. And I think a lot of guys run their hardest 400 only on competition day. Um, so I think maybe that's yep, something yeah, else. Guilt, guilty as charged. Um, <laughs> well, you know, and I, I feel too, like there's something to be said for having something like that in your life where you're like facing that adversity. And I like, I, I agree with you, Jim, like it really does like go hand in hand with whatever else you're doing. Um, you know, it's like, it's funny. I, I always used to have this thought, like after I graduated college, uh, I was like, how bad can it be? Like, they can't make me run. Like no yeah. matter what I do, like I'm not gonna like get sent to the line. I was like, this is actually gonna be easy right. <laughs> in the worst yeah. world. Um, so like, how do you guys typically structure your day then? Because like I said, you I think this might have been before we were recording. You guys are now over a hundred people. Um, I mean, I was looking at some of the retailers that you guys are in. I see you everywhere. First and foremost, yeah. let me start by saying that. But you're in Walmart, Whole Foods, Wegmans. Like, you guys are crushing it. Dude, thank you. Yeah. So for us, I mean, it's funny, you, you touched on this sort of trans translation from our life as college athletes to life as professionals or entrepreneurs. And those two things, I mean, we wouldn't be able to do what we do today in terms of running and growing this business if we weren't college athletes. You know, it's mm. everything you touched on, sort of the discipline, the willingness to do the hard work that other people aren't willing to do teamwork, the resilience of bouncing back after losses. You know, we, we face a lot of losses at, at building a, building a startup here at super coffee. Uh, but I think our background as athletes has really given us an ability to overcome that. You know, it's not the first time we've, we've lost at something. Um, and then I, I think it, we, we structure our, our team, the hundred 
full-time people, we feel like we're on a football team again. You know, mm. we're, we're all sort of committed to this, these, these goals that are bigger than us. You know, we say that we, we, we exist to mass produce positive energy and we have a hundred teammates that are bought into that mission. Yeah. yeah and in, in regards to like structuring our day and routines. And I think it's funny what you just mentioned about like, no matter what, no one's going to make us go run, you know, right. Like, yeah. like, <laughs> like I, I do often think back to college athletics because if you think about like your hardest days of your life, like there's nothing harder than the alarm clock going off at 5 a.m., like going to a lift and then right. going to meetings and then classes and then midterms. Like, so like, I think that that structure laid the foundation of what it takes to be a successful business person. Um, and then for us, I think we love our morning routines and, and really it starts. I heard a great quote, a great morning routine starts with a great nighttime routine. So getting uh, to bed early. The three of us tr try to focus on, on getting to bed definitely in the sheets before 10 PM. Um, we don't have a family like you at home, so there's no little one. So we can kind of <laughs> take that, that personal time to shut it down. Um, and then when we're not traveling, try to be up, work out and then into the office certainly by seven and then have some time for the three of us to connect. Um, uh, because then once eight 30 AM rolls around, you're fully servicing the team, you know, in our executive team, but all the way down to the frontline people that are in the grocery stores. Um, and so like, you guys are, you guys are in the office at seven. Yeah. I mean like today, and we, we, we like to now, I mean, we have a, a incredible team of people who are smarter than us, better at us than what we do. <laughs> so we just try and service them. Um, so like this morning we were actually shooting content. We shoot videos for all of our partners and anyone on our team can request a brother's video. Um, so one of our buyers out in Southern California, we were just shooting a, a video telling them about the new products, but it's just for our sales rep who calls on that account. Um, they wow. can be like, Hey, like Jimmy, Jake and Jordan wanted to say hi, introduce the new products. And that's how they'll open their sales meeting. But basically every day from like 8.30 to 4.30, we, the three of us are here really just to make sure our team has everything they need to be successful. Um, oh. Cause we, like our biggest fear honestly is being the bottleneck of like someone else being productive. Like, and that all too often is the truth of like, hey, that's on Jim's desk. I'm waiting for sign off on that. Like that's a shitty feeling if you're Jim, like I'm holding someone else up from doing their job at a high level. Right. Um, so I think that answered the question. I don't know, I just talked a lot. No, that was great. That was great. And you guys, you guys are getting workouts in before that. So you guys, you guys, what time are you guys getting up? Yeah, we, I mean, we're inconsistent, right? I, I, I hate that. Like the, the, the people that say I wake up at five, I'm at the gym at five 30. I'm meditating by six like that. I wish I could do that, but like right. uh, my alarm will go off between five, five 30. Sometimes I hit snooze till six 30, you yeah. know, and if I feel good in the morning, I'll get a 20 minute workout in. I think that's the biggest difference between now and, and student athletes you know like when we were in college you're doing 90 minute olympic lifts you know right. we, we just don't have time for that so what we do like all if, whether i'm getting into the gym in the morning or after work at night it's 20 minutes interval training i'll cycle through some some light weights but get the heart rate up you can really get a lot of volume into a 20 minute workout yeah, yeah. This, is a, this is a good jim to seco quote it's like when you got it get after it you know like nah, you know, i love they, it like there, we definitely are aspirational probably more so than regimented in our wake ups. You know, like that alarm probably goes off at four forty five or five. The consistency is like Jim said, it's not five days a week. We're not robots. We're not like Jocko uh, hitting that at four thirty every morning. Um, but then when you got it, like go get like get after, it, you know, um, and I think really from a workout perspective as well. Uh, another gym quote is like, if you can get one or two like on your worst weeks, if you can get one or two in during the week. And then really win that weekend with like one or two really good ones. Um, you're looking at three or four good movements over the course of the week. That's yeah. a week. That, that's not a, for that being your worst week. That's not that bad. Yeah. No. And I, I think that's a really good perspective because, uh, and dude, I do love me some Jocko. I'm right <laughs> yeah. um, but it's, it's like, yeah, it's, if you set the bar to where you have to be so regimented, like life gets in the way inevitably, right? And when you start missing things, it's easy to start beating yourself up or like you give up on the whole routine altogether. Um, but I feel like having some flexibility and recognizing like when you get a shot to, to get a win, get it. You know what I mean? Put that away in your bank. And over time, like all those small little victories like start to add up. And to your point, it sounds like you can actually get a lot done in a short amount of time. Yeah, because most of the time you're forcing yourself to get out of bed and sort of get your ass to the gym and suffer through a workout just to get there. 
But on that rare occasion, maybe one day a week, one day every other week, you're like, damn, I feel good. You know, right, and right, right. Like, I, I, there's been times where I had a 20 minute workout planned because I had a call or something coming up. I actually canceled the call because I'm just like, I'm feeling good. I'm going to let this rip. You know, it's rarely <laughs> do I have this energy. I'm going right. to get after it. Yeah. yeah. No, I, th- that point, I think, is everything. Don't set unrealistic expectations to yourself that are going to make you give up. You know, like just know that anything is better than nothing. Like that mm. is such a, a powerful mentality. Um, and then on that same, to Jim's point too, like a lot of times, like just choosing not to snooze is the hardest part. You know, like yeah. once you get out of bed, like that was the win. And then you can That's keep a great point. Yeah. No, no I, I agree with that. And I battle that daily. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's funny, like you guys, it, it's early too. People probably don't know this. Uh, if we had the video recorded, they would see just how early it is on my face. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you guys have like such uh, an energy and like a positivity about you. Is, is that just something that's kind of like intrinsic to both of you? Or is that something that has also kind of been like crafted over time? I think both, right? It starts with how we were brought up. Our mom is super optimistic. Um, and she really taught us early on without saying these words, but it's this, these principles of like work hard and be nice to people, right? If yeah, you're going to work your ass off, like, yeah, like competitive and compassionate. And I think we were naturally competitive. You know, we were, we played every sport growing up. We just wanted to win. We wanted to compete. We were on the same teams, but we weren't assholes about it. You know, like we were nice to our teammates. We were nice to the competitors and it, like, I think that is a s- critical message. And, and I think in entrepreneurship, like I said, there's so many challenges. You're going to fail so often that you have to be optimistic. You know, I, I've mm. never met a successful person who isn't eternally optimistic. You know, like there's not, there's not very many negative people who make it to the pinnacles of their careers. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, it's definitely worked on though, you know, and, and I would say that Jim is probably more of the three of us, the most like realist or pessimistic of the group. Um, and then I'm probably just one of the, like naturally one of the, the more positive people just in the world, but it's still, <laughs> like, literally I'm just so like, I don't know. Like I take things like super lightheartedly, like things that stress Jim out, don't stress me out. Um, yeah. but like, I am very, very aware. And I think over the last year or two, I've become much more aware of like how powerful like your self-talk is. And if your self-talk is positive and you're already positive, you're only going to get better results. And if your yeah. self-talk's positive and you're overtly or you're intrinsically negative, you're still going to get better results. So it's like just looking at things in a glass half full mentality only yield benefit. No matter no matter what, like saying it's half empty or shit's not going, gonna the ball's not going to bounce the right way. Like that's never paid benefit to anybody. Yeah. Definitely. And we, we talked a little bit about Jocko and I feel like we even talked about David Goggins uh, yeah, briefly exactly. last year. Like wh- where, where are you guys looking to for like external sources of like motivation, positivity? Like, are you guys big into like podcasts reading or is a lot of this just kind of to your point, like a lot of these like tough lessons that are learned, like as an entrepreneur and just kind of like growing through those experiences? Yeah, I think, I think it's both, right? But it's a pretty lonely journey if you're not looking outward, right? It, mm. the, the thing is, like any, any entrepreneur, we're not reinventing the wheel here. There's smart people who have come before us and, and done these things. And whether you're selling coffee or building a tech company, like you're going to face the same challenges. It's the same process. So we really look to, uh, to, to business leaders as well. We've been pretty fortunate to uh, be mentored by some of the former CEOs of, of Starbucks, which has been pretty cool. Oh, amazing. Um, yeah. So we, we talk to people who have sort of done these things, these, seen these challenges, conquered these, like came up with the solutions on a higher level in relevant categories. But yeah, dude, we totally subscribe to Jocko and Goggins. Like that's, <laughs> I mean, you always got to stay dangerous, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, definitely reading podcasts, but honestly, I think what's worked really well for us, it's just getting inspiration from the people you surround yourself with. Uh, and I think that's one thing that we've just been lucky is like keeping our circle super tight. Um, and like a lot of the people we spend our most time with are like some of our childhood best friends. Um, and like then along the way, just people like the energy is contagious and you want to be around the same people that, that are like you. And we're fortunate. We get to go on a lot of podcasts. We have a lot of people on our podcast, but 
honestly, this was one that we were super excited to come on because we have so much respect for you, you know, as a competitor. Oh, I appreciate that, man. Uh, but no, like, so like these moments are the ones that we gain inspiration from and motivation from. And then there's the people we work with. And a great example is um, one of our business partners and brothers, Devin Levake, just bear crawled the New York City Marathon. First what? person in history. Yeah. First person in history to bear crawl a marathon. And the fact that Devin was bear crawling the marathon that morning, I felt motivated to go out. And at 3 a.m., I ran the first marathon that I've ever run. The day at 3 a.m.? 3, 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. Then went to you work that day. such savages. <laughs> but that only would ever have been possible because Devin was bear crawling the marathon. And we we're only involved with Devin because he's our business partner. We're like-minded. But I think like – so to your point, like you have the Jockos, you have the Goggins of the world. But it's really the, the heroes in your life that motivate you. And I think that, that we learned that intrinsically from our mother, honestly, ah. who is someone who always was inspiration for us. So keeping it close to home is something that I, I think the three of us look inward for, the two of us for sure, Jordan as well. Dude, that's amazing. Can we talk a minute about this bear crawl? Oh, yes. my oh my god! Yes. Like I'm, I'm worried right now about his hands. Like, yeah, oh, yeah his hands I mean, he had what? So he was like gloved up. How long did it take him? Took him 20 hours. He started at 5 p.m. on a Friday, and he finished at one o'clock the next the next Saturday. Uh, and it's something he's been training for. Like even back in March, he declared like that he went on the New York Post, he went on Fox News, and and they were all interviewing. They're like, dude, you're gonna you're gonna do this marathon? He's like, yeah, even if. COVID cancels it. I'm going to, I'm still going to do it. And right. it, it's a sad story, but it's a, it's a great story and a great cause. When Devin was 16, his dad commits suicide and uh. the, the marathon was in partnership with this foundation called fit ops. Um, it's a, a group of veterans that raise awareness for mental health. Uh, and I mean, brands like super coffee sponsored it, raised a ton of awareness, a ton. Of, it's sort of like the D 10, if you will, like we, okay. we, we created a lot of awareness and a lot of, uh, a lot of funds for mental health foundations that, that fit ops is associated with. And, uh, I mean, Devin, I'll, I'll give that kid credit, man. We asked him, we were like, dude, what was the hardest mile? He was like, at mile 11, it was cold. It was the middle of the night. I didn't think I was going to finish. And I'm oh, like, holy wow. shit, you had, you had 15 miles to go after right, that. Exactly. Right, exactly. And, and uh, you just bear down, pun intended. The, wow. the craziest part, though, is he tried to do it a year ago, like almost a year to the date that he completed it. Oh, really? Got a half mile done. Literally a half mile, and that was it had to stop thought it was impossible and then he did it this year and we walked with him the last like two and a half miles and the kid was fresh like when i say fresh it was like like if someone said uh go bear crawl 50 yards that's what he looked like the whole last two and a half miles and he was like he finished popped up gave a speech within minutes of finishing hugged his mom his girlfriend started crying and then gave a speech to everyone that was there and he was like i worked every day for one year to do this every day broke my body down recovered built it up broke my body down and had the cycle but i was obsessed with it and it's just crazy to think he couldn't do a half a mile a year prior and then was doing 26.2 like almost effortlessly i don't want to say effortlessly but physically he right. was there i think mentally was really the battle uh, but it was it was nuts. Uh, when you said Man. that, the, the training for a year, I, I couldn't help but think about Happy Gilmore, just 365 days. Bear crawl, chipping away. Yeah, well, I just like uh, I I got to talk to this guy at some point. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah well, the same not, dude. I'm just like blown away. But th the fact that he tried it a year before and only got a half mile, like that that mental barrier, and the fact that the hardest mile was mile 11, and then. As spectators, you're saying the last two miles, he looked fresh. Like, it's just incredible the power of the mind. You know what I mean? Oh, and like yeah. the, the, the body's capacity for work and like uh, to deal with adversity is just so much higher than, than people realize. It's incredible. Yeah, we'll, we'll put him in touch with you. He'd be a great guest for the show. Um, but I, I mean, on that same note about mental toughness and capacity, like one of the most impressive things that we've seen at the D10 is when you do your pull-ups. So for, for those who haven't seen Ken do pull-ups, <laughs> Uh, uh -huh. as long as you're, as long as you're hanging on the bar, you can, you can go for an unlimited amount of time, as long as you, you, you're still ripping. So the, the, the craziest thing I've ever seen, what do you weigh? 220? Yeah, I'm about 225. Yeah. 225. This dude will rip through 20, 25, 30 pull-ups, but then he hangs on the bar <laughs> with one hand and shakes his arms out and then keeps going. So like, for, I mean, that's not easy, dude. And that hurts. Like to me, that's a <laughs> mental thing. It is mental. Yeah. Cause you, most people, you, you, 
you do your last pull up and you jump off the bar. Yeah. Yeah. You can't even get up there. You can't even get your chin above the bar. So I, I guess when, when your hands and your forearms are burning, like what, where do you go? Where does, where do you go in that pain cave? Yeah. Well, already you guys are now my favorite guests. Cause I don't, <laughs> think, I, I don't think I've ever gotten so many positive compliments. Uh, no, you know what? So it's funny. I, I don't think I've actually talked about this on the show, but like the first year that I, I did the D 10, um, I really was like not in great shape the year prior when I, when I made the decision to do it, I had not been running. I, I don't think I had jumped in three years. Like I would go to the gym and I would do a lot of the stuff that, you know, like, I don't know, I would bench, I would maybe do pull-ups maybe. Um, but I was like, I, my dad, my dad had gotten sick with cancer and I was like, I really want to do something. The D10, I've been aware of it. It's an awesome cause. I was like, this is what I'm going to do to kind of like uh, raise awareness for cancer research, but also, um, you know, like do something kind of in his honor. So, you know, a lot of these events are brutal. The 500 meter row, like you said, the 400 meter, like my last 400 meter was in high school. It was a state track meet. It was a state finals. Uh, I was on the four by four, not the, not, not running on my own. When I finished that, I swore to myself, I will never run another 400 meter as long as I live. Like if no one has run one, it is the most like, it just breaks your body down. Uh, it is literally basically an all out sprint, like for longer than your body should probably be able to do it. Um, so as I was kind of like diving back into all this training, like the mental barrier was really high. Um, and so for me, you know, I, I don't even know when I started doing this, but I would just kind of try and start like blacking out, so to speak. Like I would just get so pinpoint focused on the work, um, that I would just get like tunnel vision. Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes like I would try and use something to get me to that point. Like sometimes I, I would think about my kids. Like if I was running a 400 and that last hundred meters is just unfathomable, you know, I would just get so laser focused on like thinking about my kid cheering me on or for me thinking about my kids seeing me give up, mm -hmm. um, which is like a, you know, it, it's an input that I didn't have in college, you yeah. know, like that was new, yeah. but it was something that was such an intrinsic motivator that it would like get me to that point where I would be so laser focused that I, I wouldn't give up and I would be able to push through it. Um, you know, so with something like the pull-ups, uh, I, you know, when I get to that moment, like I do, I get super nervous before events. I don't know if you guys can relate to that. Totally. Like, like literally the thought of going before 400, like all that negative yeah. self talk. Yeah. like I, I want to puke. I'm like, I can't believe I fucking, I'm going to do this again. Right. But once it like starts, I just go into like a zone uh, yeah. and having you watch you guys run a 400 and 800, you probably relate. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think it's just like, I try and black out everything else and I just get so solely focused on the moment. Um, you know, that nothing else matters. And so those moments when I'm like hanging there, uh, I don't know, man, there's like nothing going on in there. I gotta be honest. Like I'm not, yeah, think yeah. I'm not, I'm not thinking, I'm not like, Oh, this is terrible. It's just like, what do I need to do to like get one more rep? And then I get that rep and then I just go and I wait again. And it's like, what do I need to do to get another? Yeah, um, that's savage shit. Like, literally, <laughs> like that's, that's literally, but no, you're right. And it's weird because it takes a long time to develop that. And that's almost like I graduated playing college football and like I hung up the cleats and I was like, I have no regrets. You know, like I, 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 I felt at the time that like I gave everything it's all, maybe there's a pass I dropped here or there, a block I missed or something. But for the yeah. most part, I was like, I, I was a college athlete that got after it. And now like the, the more you sharpen your mind and, and mental fortitude and, and get better every day, like you almost have more regrets. Cause it's like, shit, man. Like if I was this person playing college football, physically wouldn't have That's happened. a great like, point. Yeah. And like, that's the only time that I think back, like, damn, I wish I was like this level that I'm at now mentally back then. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, here. I, I agree, man. It, it's incredible what the mind is, is capable of. I'll give you a really kind of like twisted example of trying to test this out. So I had just listened to like David Goggins, book. And I, this is, I, I don't talk about David Goggins this often on the podcast, actually. So I don't want you guys to know that, but I had just listened to his book and he talked about how with no training, he went out and ran like a hundred mile race or whatever it was. And he just broke yeah. his body down to such a point where he almost killed himself. I was in the car going to a business meeting in Delaware. So from where I live, I don't know, it was like an hour, hour and a half. Um, and about halfway through, I had to use the bathroom and I had to use it like bad. But I was like, you know what? 
I'm going to see how mentally tough I am. I'm going to hold this thing the whole way until I get to this business meeting. And dude, so for like 45 minutes, I just white knuckled the, you know, the, the steering wheel, <laughs> Strange. And just like convince myself that I could mentally power through. Uh, and I did, it was horrible. And then at the end of it, I was like, what is wrong with you? Yeah, like, what, there, there's no reason to like try and push yourself to do this. But it's a again, I was like, wow, it was a, it was a mental rep. <laughs> Dude, it's crazy though. So I told you that uh, the Devin thing, like I was motivated to go out and run a marathon and I have never right. run a marathon. And I woke up at 3 a.m. I That was the hardest part. Jim asked me what was the hardest part. I said mile 26 and waking up. Those were like the two hardest parts of the whole thing. Uh, so but wild. put my shoes on. It was the worst day of the year. It was 38 degrees. It was pouring rain. It was like two weeks to two Fridays ago. But uh, I packed Wait, my AirPods. You, you, did, you did this two Fridays ago? Two Fridays ago. <laughs> two Fridays ago. It, but, dude, I had my AirPods in my pocket with me because I was like, okay, like I'm going to listen to music. Like I'm going to be running for four hours. And But when I went out, I was like, it'll be nice to like hear the rain hit the ground, like talk, have some positive self-talk. I never put my AirPods in all three hours and 53 minutes. Really? Never once. Yeah. And the whole time just lasered in talking to myself. Um, but it was just like, you like just hitting those moments of just like thinking about one, why you're doing it two why you're not going to stop and three, like what it's going to feel like when you finish. Um, but like, if I would have been like screwing around, like listening to Drake, I probably wouldn't have finished, you know, like it was just like, That's you incredible. kind of black out. Yeah. So I, I thought that was, uh, had, had you been, had you been training for the marathon at all? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. But well, it was okay. like. That was for Devin. Like I only did it because yeah. Devin was getting ready to run. And the, my intention was like, if Devin is on mile 24 and there's any way when he's ready to quit that my me running an untrained marathon pushes him to say, I'm not going to quit even an ounce of him, then it's worth it a hundred X. But it's, yeah, like, it, it's so incredible. I mean, yeah, you like you literally can like pick up that positivity and that motivation from someone else and it can like force you to do things that you really didn't think were possible. Like it, it is really incredible the impact that like someone else can have on what you can do as an individual. Well, and the crazy shit is like those mo I think we all have the ability to be like intensely motivated for a moment, like listening yeah. to a Goggins podcast. And then just like like the the savages or like the savage moments are just letting that extend. Like Goggins, like to his point, he did it for a uh, hundred mile run. Right. Like, like Devin just stayed in that for twenty one hours, bear crawling straight. You know, like you do it when you're hanging from the bars. You know, it's just like how long can you keep that moment there for? Um, I think is what like and, and, and then we talk about guys like Jocko. Like that's what Navy SEALs train to oh, do man. to like stay locked in. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, dude, I'm still just so blown away. And let me also say that what I do with the pull-ups is in no way even should be in comparison with this bear crawl marathon. I like that. <laughs> yeah. actually, that actually might be the most wild thing I've ever heard. And I don't know how I haven't heard about it until now. Uh, and the sad thing is, is it makes the fact that you just woke up at like 3 a.m. and went and ran a marathon almost sound like feasible. Because that right. also is just so ridiculous to me. Especially that's like in, in this it, weather. Ah, uh, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, rel and that's the thing is like relativity. Like anything you like, if that's why I'm always blown away. Like a marathon is only so hard because it, like or twenty six point two one because it's obviously physically hard. Yeah. But if a marathon was forty two, like then a, people would be running halves and they would be crushing these twenty one mile halves when they right. think it's impossible to run more than thirteen point one when they go out and run their half. That's like a life accomplishment. No, that's, that's actually a great point. Yeah, man, it's, dude, it is so mental. And everyone says that. And I think it, most people understand that generally. Um, but like when you've pushed yourself through something that's incredibly difficult and then you come out the other end being like, oh, wow, I actually have a lot more in the tank still. Mm -hmm. Like you just realize how significant those mental barriers are. Yeah, dude. And it's, it's, uh, it, it is mental. Everything we're talking about is mental. And, and there's a story, I forget the guy's name, but like, I think in the forties or fifties, the the first person to ever run a four minute mile ran the four minute mile. And before the that it was in Bannister, right? Bannister. Bannister. Yeah. yeah. And you know the story. It was it was impossible before that. Nobody could do it. But as soon as he did it and proved that it could be done, 
then every year after that, people were running four minute miles, three fifties, three thirties. I think somebody just ran a sub three minute mile. Oh, <laughs> Someone no, ran but the, a sub the, two hour marathon. But yeah, high school, yeah. high school kids are running like sub, right? Like yeah, 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 yeah. now exactly. it's like a common place for like really like elite. It's, it's incredible. Um, so something else, and I'd be remiss if I didn't bring this up with you guys. Cause like the company that you have built and I mean, as an outsider looking in relatively quickly, uh, is, is just incredible. And I know you guys have talked about your backstory a little bit, but would you mind just sharing kind of like how super coffee came into being? Yeah. Uh, I'll touch on and then let Jim, let Jim take it, take it away, but, or add on, uh, one, it's a, it's a five year overnight success story. So like it, it by no means is it, is it quick? Um, uh, but I, yeah. I guess relative it, it might be, but, um, we were all college athletes. Our younger brother, Jordan, uh, he was a freshman, full scholarship basketball player. And he uh, was tired of going to his school store and seeing the, the coffee options were just Starbucks and then the energy drink options were just uh, Red Bull and Monster. They were all loaded with sugar. Um, he was like, this is ridiculous. Uh, so he was like, he had an idea to make a, a, a coffee that didn't have sugar that was going to give you added functional benefit, like not just caffeine, but things like protein and healthy fats from coconut oil. Um, so he was like, I'm going to start this thing and, and all the credit in the world to him to be a, a freshman full scholarship kid to say, I'm going to start a business calls me up at, I'm at Georgetown. Jim's graduated from Colgate university. Um, and he's like, Hey, do you want to start this with me? And I'm like, sure. You know, like we're going into our, like our summers, like let's start this thing. We get it off the ground. And this is where all the credit in the world goes to Jordan. He is willing to drop out of school, give up his full scholarship to start this coffee company. That's no, exactly kidding. what he did. Yeah, that's exactly what he did. Uh, at that point, Jim uh, was working on wall street. He had a great job out of Colgate. And he, when Jordan dropped out, he was like, man, I can like, if you're willing to do that, I will leave my job as well. So these guys uh, teamed up. Jordan was living with me when we started the business. But I was going back for my senior football season at Georgetown and finishing business school there. So th they moved in down by me in, in D.C. and we got started. That was 2016. We grew steadily year over year. We were super naive. We had no clue what we were doing. Yeah, I think that's the important thing too. It's like it's not like we jump, dropped Jordan dropped out with a bunch of money behind us and like parents who've done this before. Our mom worked at the YMCA. Our dad was a construction worker. I, I studied liberal arts at Cole. Like I didn't know what a right. startup was. I'd never heard that term before. So like we were going into this thing totally blind, just with an idea and a vision of a better for you energy drink. Yeah, and then like I mean, we were making making the product. So the way we got started, we showed up at Whole Foods, right? We had never been to a Whole Foods until that day. Cause like <laughs> we're from upstate New York. There are no Whole Foods in upstate New York. We would shop at like ShopRite is where our mom does. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we go into Whole Foods, we're blown away by the set. We buy an honest tea. We take the honest tea back to our dorm room in a glass bottle. Uh, Jordan brews up a batch of super coffee. We peel the label off the honest tea. We go to the business school at Georgetown, print out a label that we made on, and, and put it on with sticky paper. Go back to that same Whole Foods where we bought the bottle from like four hours later. And we're like, hey, we make coffee. Do you want to buy some? And the buyer's like, ah, this looks pretty janky. We're like, no, it's going to get better. That's just a mock-up. And he's like, no, I'm good. We're like, well, you, we can get Georgetown students up here. It's the, it's the, it's the Whole Foods a mile off campus. And he's like, you know what? I'll give you a shot. And once he took us in, we went and found a place to make it. We brought him product like eight weeks later. And we were just like, hey, we're going to, no matter what, like our, our competitive like college athlete came out and we're like, we are going to be the best drink in this store. Coffee, water, juice, you name it. So we would just go to that store and pour samples and did. We became the best coffee in that store. Then we went to another Whole Foods and became the best coffee in that Whole Foods and just did this for the whole first year. Um, and at that point we were the best selling bottle of coffee at 20 whole foods in the greater Washington, DC, like DC to Philly. And we could raise money. And that's when we really started to build a business. But that first year was straight grit. And the only reason it was straight grit is because that's all we knew. We literally knew like make it, deliver it, and then sell it off the shelf by physically being there. Um, wow. so that's, yeah, it's Dude, crazy. So I generally knew, I didn't realize all of this. This is incredible. So Jordan actually dropped out of school. Like, uh, I, I would say like having been a college athlete, I never would have taken that next step to say like, Oh, how, how can I actually improve this and make it better? I just probably would have been like, well, these are the options I have. I need an energy drink. This is what I'm going to do. Like 
is is he very entrepreneurial minded in nature or like i mean like where did this kind of come from for for him yeah so so uh none of us were great students so after high school jordan had to do a a post-grad year like a prep school year where he's playing basketball up in rhode island and the the boarding school or the prep school that he went to the dining hall closed at like 7 p.m and after seven you couldn't get any food on campus so he would walk to sam's club and he would buy burgers, hot dogs. He had a little George Foreman grill. And this dude was just flipping burgers in the, in the basement of his, uh, of his dorm. Just <laughs> set, like he was making a thousand bucks a week because every kid on campus would, would come through. And buy. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, he had that, he had that in him and he wasn't somebody who got excited by schoolwork or books or classes or anything like that. So he's like, look, I love basketball. I'm at a D2 school, probably not going to go to the NBA. Uh, meanwhile, bottle coffee is a $3 billion category. The Starbucks Frappuccino does 90% of revenue in it. It's got 40 grams of sugar, 300 calories. Like there's an opportunity here to, to really disrupt this industry with wow. something better that, that and removing sugar from America's diet. Yeah. And I would be remiss not to add that like, we weren't like just going out and doing it and being hopeful. Like that first summer when we were dreaming, Jordan and I, we were dreaming more than we were working, but the dream was always to create at the time, it was a hundred million dollar coffee company. Like that was the intention, you know. So it wasn't That's what like, I was going to ask you, yeah, yeah. So it was always very intentional. Like there needs to be scale behind this, you know. It wasn't like I think a lot of people go into like very similar stories to Jordan, but it's like I'm just going to do this to do it, you know. And like there's no driver. So we always knew that this was going to be a sprint, um, and I think that's how we kind of show up because. And then like just a, a, a timeline of our business for your, for your uh, listeners to understand like where we are today, yeah, we did 200 K in sales that first year. And then in 2016 then 2017, we did just about a million dollars in sales and still very gritty. And then in 2018, we started to figure it out a little bit and started to hire some people, like I said, that were smarter than us. And we went from about 1 million to close to 5 million oh, that wow. year. Five and then twenty, yeah. Then twenty nineteen, we went from five to close to like twenty five. Like I think we finished at twenty seven that year. Um, and then this year, in a COVID year, very ambitious. We're going to finish right around sixty million in sales. That's amazing. Uh, so, that, like, you can see the compounding results from those first delivery days. And all we did was scale that, like, like attention to the customer in the attention to the partner. And in our eyes, it, like, we sell it to the store. And most people as a brand, you, your work technically is done. Like you're paid at that point. Huh. Um, but, but the biggest thing is like, you really want to get paid again. And the way to get paid again is to sell more to the store, meaning what they bought sold. So we have this extreme focus on like getting as much product into the store and then as much product out of the store as quickly as possible. Hmm. The only way that really works is by being taking as good care of the partner as possible and as good care of the customer as possible. That's amazing. Well, you know, and you said as much like, you know, you had a liberal arts degree from Colgate, like you didn't even know like what an entrepreneur was. How did you guys even go about creating like the product itself? You know, like, yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. I'm just so interested because it's like coffee. Okay. That's pretty straightforward. But what you guys are doing is like pretty innovative in the way that you're like removing sugar from it, adding a bunch of like beneficial ingredients, like how did you guys even start to like dig into that piece of the process? Yeah. So, I mean, what, what the product is today is, is something that it's always, always really been. It's coffee with protein, MCT oil, healthy fats, uh, and zero sugar sweetened with monk fruit. So it tastes like a Starbucks Frappuccino, but 80 calories, zero sugar, 10 grams yeah. of protein. And I think most of your listeners can relate. Like we're all athletes. We're all at home chef and stuff up in the blender, whether it's a banana smoothie with protein powder and ashwagandha, like whatever. I'm sure people have their own routines. Uh, yeah. and, and for us, that's what it was. Jordan sort of mixed up a, a, a super coffee, right? That's all it was, was a super coffee. He added organic coffee and protein MCT oil, pretty, pretty normal stuff. And, uh, he was like, wow, this works for me. It works for my teammates, it works for my classmates. Let's put it in a bottle and sell it. The first bottles, the label sucked. The product was terrible. Like the protein <laughs> was clumpy and we didn't care, man. We showed up and, and we sold a, 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 we sold our asses off because that's, it, that was in our control. And it was sick to us. We were like, this shit is epic. Yeah, we were like, wow, this is the best. (laughs) best. And it kind of was. There was nothing else like it. So I think that is where, like, if you are innovative, like, you can launch, like, something that's not perfect by any means. 
and even but if nothing else is relatively close you're in a you can win you know and like mm. even like the initial uber like it was a platform where someone would go on and request a ride and someone on the back end was like texting a driver to go find them and pick them up you know so like for us we never we're not chemists we're not in product we don't know any of that crap I mean, even like some of the first batches when we were, we were making it, you know, and so what was sold at Whole Foods, we made by hand. And there were times where like Jim was like going like arm deep in this vial of this like 100 gallon thing of super coffee, totally not legal. <laughs> um, but we just were doing it, you know, we were doing it. And the story of super coffee is not the story of like making a great product and having that run the way. It's literally having a, a minimal viable product and then just making tiny, tiny improvements and then being resilient to, to understand that you're not going to fail if you keep making improvements. And the only thing from a product standpoint that really guided us was the general principle that we existed more for the Walmart customer than we did the Whole Foods customer. So oh, that really, and that really guided us from like what we could do from uh, ingredients standpoint, like our cost always mattered and our taste always mattered. And then also we had like some pretty good principles on what the nutrition facts needed to be and that we weren't going to compromise too badly by using like vegetable oil or high fructose corn syrup. But we weren't also going to be using things like ashwagandha or like lion's mane or like these super niche thing so it's like balancing mainstream and innovation to get to like that destination what do you always say like familiar enough or differentiate yeah familiar? yeah it's like you have a, a spectrum on like one side is familiar and on the on the other side is novel like familiar might be a starbucks frappuccino and novel might be something loaded with adaptogens that you buy at your local juice bar you got to find something in the middle right because if it's too familiar it's boring and people won't won't pick it up right it's nothing it's not different enough but if it's too novel it, it, it'll go over people's heads and they won't adopt it either so like mm. we found this balance of sort of like this biohacking science but also familiar flavor uh, a recognizable name super coffee uh and it's priced competitively with the mainstream stuff so it works as well in walmart as it does in whole foods yeah and i think that's the story too i mean like entrepreneurs and we fell victim to this and we just learned quickly but like you try to look for differentiation around every corner you know like this part of the product can be different. That part of the product can be different. Our go-to-market strategy is going to be different. Our marketing is going to be different. Everything's going to be differentiated. But like, really, you need one or two things that make customers and people know that this is different. You know, and like, I should try it because of that. And yeah. if you try to have it that be ten different things, no one's going to remember, and you end up with like a tiny addressable market that's willing to educate themselves on why you're different. Interesting. So how much, I mean, what was your process for kind of figuring that out? Like, was it, was it very early on? You're like, look, we want mass appeal, but we want to be differentiated. Or is this something that like over time, um, through either like mentors or just kind of trial and error that you kind of like honed in on trial and error. You know, we, we thought that in the early days, like three college students creating a better for you energy solution for college students. We're like, holy shit, let's sell this on every college campus in the country. So that's what we came out. We came out of the gate swinging on colleges and we learned, we quickly learned that most college campuses have exclusive contracts with either Coca-Cola or Pepsi. So uh, ran into a wall there, not something we knew ahead of time. That's just a good quick story because we would go on college campuses and we didn't even care that they had Coke exclusive. We would get in, we would dominate, and then that's when Coke would kick us off. But like, uh. that was two years of pounding our head against walls of like, this is the way that worked. But it was like, not only did our product need to be differentiated, we were selling investors and these people on the story that like our go-to-market was gonna be highly innovative. We weren't worried about grocery stores. We wanted to come on college campuses, which is only a tiny business anyway, compared to uh. where the bulk of volume happens in, in like C stores and grocery stores. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, we, we, you learn over the, over the, the course of it, right? Like there's 450 whole foods in, in the U S it's a good sized business, but there's 4,500 Walmarts, you know? So right. we're like, and I think 80% of the U S population is within 10 miles of a Walmart. Uh, so for us, it's like, all right, we got to we, we, we broke in through the natural channel. Now we got to get to the more conventional stuff, the giants, the Safeways, the Albertsons of the world, the Kroger's, um, and I mean, we're still not there yet. We're probably only 40% available in the U S. Um, so still, still working our way up. Yeah. Awesome. And I would say trial and error, trial and error, but then also like you start to get some natural product market fit, 
and listening to customers. And it's like, mm. shit, maybe, maybe Whole Foods isn't the, the, the Mecca for us, you know, and like um, paying attention to like what other brands did it too. I think that's like the other big thing is like success leaves clues, you know, and like watching what other brands did and how they got there. Like sure. Whole Foods is a great place to launch because like you can do a lot of the things that show up in poor samples where right? like your local Acme or your local Safeway, you can't, you don't really see a lot of that. But over time, we were just following blueprints of, of brands like Vitamin Water, and Buy, and Honest Tea. Um, and yeah. we just kind of putting our own unique twist on them. But I think not recreating the wheel is is one of the best pieces of advice for anyone in life. It's like be innovative, but follow someone else's path. Just put your own twist on it. No, that's, I mean, that's that's great advice. I love that too. Success leaves clues. Um, so w- w- with a little bit of time left, uh, you know, we talked about some of the mental barriers that your buddy hit when he was like bear crawling. Uh, for you guys, and again, like it, it's been five years uh, for you, I'm sure in some ways it probably feels like a lot longer. It might feel like a lot less, you know, w- what have been like the most challenging points uh, up until this point? Was it those early days getting started? Has it been like this kind of I, what I imagine would be like a new uh, challenge of scaling? Like what has kind of been like the barriers for you guys so far? Uh, yeah, I, I think. I think it's evolving as young leaders, you know, for the first two uh-huh. years, we, we did everything, every single role within the company. It was just the three of us and, and accounting, d- deliveries, marketing, sales, manufacturing, like it was just us. Uh, now today we're a hundred full-time employees. Like that happened really quick, you know? So I, I think growing up as leaders and, and uh, I mean, we still have this mentality that we are, the three of us are players, you know, and we need coaches and, and, uh, we've been pretty fortunate to, we have an awesome executive coach. We have some great mentors some great investors, and we're not afraid to ask questions. You know, we, we certainly know uh, what we don't know. You know, we're, we're uh, naive, which has allowed us to run through walls, but we ask questions where we're not afraid to admit when we're wrong. And I think that has been painful. You know, it's like, it, it's, it's a little frustrating to not have the answers, but at the same time, uh, to have the humility to ask for them. I think that's what's allowed us to, to continue to evolve. And I mean, you see it, you see it sometimes in business, it's like not every founder is a great CEO. Um, uh, and yeah. so, so, so far, like we've been working on our game to continue to evolve as the business evolves. Um, and we, we've been keeping up with it, but like, we'll see, we'll see what happens over the next five years. Yeah. yeah. It's, a re- it's a really good question. Um, I would say to Jim's point, like that our naiveness has been, our superpower over this whole journey because no matter what, where we go as a business, the three of us will always be unqualified to do the task of the day. Like, <laughs> and then you look back and you're like, and people are like, wow, like these guys are great. But like, I think it's just attack. Like, you know what I mean? Like we are not qualified to be running the business that we're running today, uh, but we just do it. And you kind of just figure it out along as you go. You just follow core principles that are, that if you stay true to in any situation, the outcome isn't going to like, you'll survive. Yeah. Um, but the hardest part, part for us, I mean, 2020 has been just such a, a year oh, of man. curveballs for everyone. Uh, but for us, it's funny because I told you like the development and how we had a lot of momentum. Um, and 2020 has been a really humbling year because coming into the year, we did so much going right. And it was almost like a reminder that no matter what, the shit's always going to be hard. You know, like probably COVID was even a, a harder uh, realization of that. Um, but then to Jim's point, it, it just is a great reminder of like, it's not actually hard. The only hard part is taking care of your people through hard times. You know, like mm. we'll take that hard shit all day, but you got to make sure that your team feels supported and that they're in a good spot. And one of our mentors has a great quote that in when, when it, lack of information, when people have lack of information, they go to a really dark place. Um, wow. and it's true. And we all, it's that's like, really true. yeah, I, I immediately related to that. Yeah. As animal, like that's just like our animal instinct, right? Like we, we, we panic, we get uncertain. And I think like this year I, I was an M, uh, like an MBA in its own, you know, like, I think that like, like the people, like, like we started this conversation, you said it, like people are going to ask like sales reps, like how did you hit your quota in 2020? Like what did you do right. five years from now? So how this year survive? I think has yeah. been just, such a battle ah man no that's i i feel like this uh this conversation is just like chock full of motivational quotes i'm all fired up now <laughs> I'm, I'm ready i'm ready to go I'm ready to go hit the up. email and sell some stuff yeah, <laughs> um well hey okay last question before we uh before we log off here 
Um, I know that, you, you know, I think the number you said in the beginning was like, hey, we're going to build this into like a hundred million dollar business. Um, it seems like with the scale, I mean, you guys already had a hundred people like, you know, now looking ahead at, at this moment in time, like what is the vision for Super Coffee? Yeah, I, I think we'd be lying if there, we said there wasn't a financial motivation, right? I think if you if you build a valuable company that is, makes an impact for others, there's going to be, uh, you, you create value for a strategic partner like a Coca-Cola or a Pepsi or a Nestle. Um, yeah. But for us, we, we've stopped thinking about like revenue milestones and, and valuations of the business. And it's more like, what impact can we make? And it's, uh-huh. it's always been about we want to be the healthy alternative to unhealthy options. And right now the leader in that space is the Starbucks Frappuccino. That thing's on every shelf in the country, you know, so we got a long way to go to get on those shelves. And I think inevitably uh, we can only get this business to a certain size on our own without the firepower of a, of a national or multinational strategic. And, and when I say strategic, it's like the, the Starbucks Frappuccino is distributed by Pepsi. The Dunkin' Donuts bottle of coffee is distributed by Coke. Right mm. now, th- th- this year we signed a partnership. We're we're the official coffee of Anheuser Busch, which is cool. It gives us like a level playing field. Um, but we need we need the muscle of of one of those billion dollar corporations to really get this thing everywhere it needs to go. So I would say within the next few years, like uh, we'll we'll continue taking investments to grow, um, but likely doing it with some strategic power behind us. Yeah, eventually we will need like. But um, I mean, since since I've already flexed and talked about sales milestones, like. We, we did a round of fundraising earlier this year and we were, business was valued at a quarter billion dollars. Yeah. So like, but we never have once thought like, so it was a hundred million dollar goal that we've done two and a half times our job already. You know, right. like we still genuinely feel that we're just getting started. Um, and to Jim's point, I mean, like, I think we want to build a brand at this point that is going to last regardless of who owns it. And like, there would be nothing cooler than if like our grandkids are going to college, drinking super coffee, you know, like picking up super. So I think like that's what motivates us and to to be a global brand. Um, But at the end of the day, like it's, it's such a unique shift because it's really like allowing our team to just achieve as much as they can. And then if they can do that and we can do that with them, then you can really achieve a lot more than what you ever dreamed of. So it's, it's, it's fun to be in that, this part of the business. Yeah, man, that's exciting. Well, dude, I, I've I've been so impressed by what you guys have done to date, uh, and it's been an absolute blast talking to you. And I'm I'm not surprised to hear that you're you're more mission driven uh, than anything else. So, w- with a couple minutes remaining for people who, uh, you know, obviously, I'll direct them to supercoffee.com. Um, but for people who want to follow you, where where can I point them? I think Instagram is probably the place where we're all most active. The the company page is at Drink Super Coffee, and you can probably find us through there. But I'm at Jimmy DeSico Five. This is at Jake DeSico. Jim's just trying to get more followers because he recently got a blue check. So he's excited. Oh, you, got the blue, you got the blue check. You got the blue check. Oh, Dude, big time. Uh, big time. <laughs> yeah, and then also, if anyone's listening and they want to reach out, uh, LinkedIn is a great place. But also, Perfect. we have an email address set up that's brothers with an S at key2life.com, K-I-T-U-L-I-F-E.com. Um, and that's a great place that our amazing customer experience team runs that uh, email and we'll get back to you. Who knows? They might even send you some free samples or a promo oh, code. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Awesome. Awesome. Dude, Jim and Jake, man, I, I really appreciate it. This has been an absolute blast. Ken, this was great, brother. Hopefully in 21, we'll, uh, we'll be able to hit the track with you again. Yeah, yeah. man. Let's, let's do it. 